Out we jumped in the warm, mad night, hearing a wild tenor man's bawling horn across the way going, ee ee and hands clapping to the beat, and folks yelling, go, go, go. And far from escorting the girls into the place, Dean Moriarty was already racing across the street with his huge bandaged thumb in the air yelling, blow, man, blow. And a bunch of colored men in Saturday night suits were whooping it up in front. It was a sawdust saloon, all wood, with a small bandstand near the john on which the fellas huddled with their hats on, blowing over people's heads. A crazy place not far from Market Street, in the dingy skid row rear of it, Howard Street, uh, Folsom Street, actually, near Harrison and the Big Bridge Causeway. Crazy, floppy women wandered around sometimes in their bathrobes, bottles clanked in alleys, and back of the joint in the dark corridor, beyond the splattered toilets, scores of men and women stood against the wall drinking wine spodiote and spitting at the stars. Wine spodiote being wine, whiskey, and beer. And the behatted tenor man was blowing at the peak of a wonderfully satisfactory free idea. A rising and falling rift that went from ee to a crazier ee and blasted along to the rolling crash of butt-scarred drums hammered by a big, brutal-looking, curl-sconced guy with a bull neck who didn't give a damn about anything but punishing his tubs. Crash, rattle boom crash, uproars of music, and the tenor man had it, and everybody knew he had it, and Dean was clutching his head in the crowd, and it was a mad crowd. They were all urging that tenor man to hold it and keep it with cries and wild eyes. He was raising himself from a crouch and going down again with his horn, looping it up in a clear cry above the furor. A six-foot skinny woman was rolling her bones at the man's horn bell, and he just jabbed it at her, playing ee, ee, ee. He had a foghorn tone. His horn was taped. He was a shipyard worker, and he didn't care. Everybody was rocking and roaring. Our girls, Galatea and Alice, with beers in their hands, were standing on the chairs, shaking and jumping. Groups of colored studs stumbled in from the street, falling over one another to get there. Stay with it, man, roared a man with a foghorn voice and let out a big groan that must have been heard clear to Sacramento. Ha ha! Wow, said Dean. He was rubbing his chest, his belly, his T-shirt was out. The sweat splashed from his face. Boom, kick. That drummer was kicking his drums down the cellar and rolling the beat upstairs with his murderous sticks. Rattledy boom. Big fat man was jumping on the platform, making it sag and creak. Woo! The pianist was only pounding the keys with spread-eagled fingers, chords only. At intervals when the great tenor man was drawing breath for another blast of phrase, Chinese chords, they shuttered the piano and every timber chink and wire. Boing! And the tenor man jumped down from the platform and just stood buried in the crowd, blowing around. His hat was over his eyes. Somebody pushed it back for him. He just hauled back and stamped his foot and blew down a hoarse, bowing blast and drew breath and raised the horn high and blew high, wide, and screaming in the air. And Dean was directly in front of him with his face glued to the bell of the horn, clapping his hands, pouring sweat on the man's keys. And the man noticed and laughed in his horn, a long, quivering, crazy mule's hee-haw, and everybody else laughed, and they rocked. And finally the tenor man decided to blow his top and crouched down and squatted on the floor and held a note in high C for a long time as everything else crashed along giddily boom, and the cries increased, and I thought the cops would come swarming from the nearest precinct. It was just a usual Saturday night good time, nothing else. The bebop winos were wailing away, the working man tenors, the cats who worked and got their horns out of hock and blue and had their women troubles, and came on in their horns with a will saying things, a lot to say, talkative horns. You could almost hear the words, and better than that, the harmony. Made you hear the way to fill up blank spaces of time with the tune and very consequence of your hands and breath and dead soul. Summer, August 1949, and Frisco blowing mad. The dew and the muscat in the interior fields of Joaquin, and down in Watsonville the lettuce blowing. The money flowing for Frisco so seasonal and mad. The railroads rolling, extra boards rolling. Crates of melons on sidewalks, bananas coming off elevators, tarantulas suffocating in the new crazy air, chipped ice 
in the cool interior smell of grape tanks. Cool bop hep cat standing slumped with horn and no lapels and blowing like Wardell. Like Brew Moore, softly. All of it insane, sad, sweeter than the love of mothers, yet harsher than the murder of fathers. The clock on the wall quivered and shook. Nobody cared about that thing. Dean was in the trance. The tenor man's eyes were fixed straight on him, and he had found a madman who not only understood but cared and wanted to understand more and much more than there was. And they began dueling for this. Everything came out of the horn. No more phrases, just cries, cries. Bah, and down to beep, and up to ee, and down to clinkers, and over to sideways, echoing horn sounds and horse laughs, and he tried everything, up and down and sideways, upside down, dog fashion, horizontal, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, and finally he fell back in somebody's arms and gave up, and everybody pushed around and yelled, yes, yes, he done blowed that one, and Dean wiped himself with his handkerchief. So up steps Freddy on the bandstand and asks for a slow beat and looks sadly out the open door over people's heads and begins singing, Close Your Eyes. Things quiet down for a minute. Freddy's wearing a tattered suede jacket, a purple shirt with white buttons, cracked shoes and zoot pants without press. He didn't care. He looked like a pimp in Mecca where there are no pimps, a barren woman's child, which is a dream. He looked like he was beat to his socks. He was down and bent, and he played us some blues. He played us some blues with his vocals. His big brown eyes were concerned with sadness and the singing of songs slowly and with long, thoughtful pauses. But in the second chorus, he got excited and embraced the mic and jumped down from the bandstand and bent to it and sing a note. It, he had to touch his shoe tops and pull it all up to blow, and he blew so much he staggered from the effect he only recovered himself in time for the next low note. He'd sing like this. Music play. And he'd lean back with his face to the ceiling and the mic held down to his pants. And he'd shake his shoulders and he gave it a hip sneer. He'd sway. Then he'd lean in almost falling with his pained face against the mic. Make it dreamy for dancing. And he looked at the street outside, wholesome, with his lips curled in scorn. While we go romancing. And he staggered sideways. Love's holiday. And he shook his head with disgust and weariness of the whole world. We'll make it seem. What would it make it seem? Everybody waited, he mourned. Okay. The piano hit a chord. Boom. So, baby, come on and just close your pretty little eyes. And his mouth quivered, offered. He looked at us, Dean and me, with an expression that seemed to say, Hey, now, what's this thing we're all putting down in the sad brown world? And then he came to the end of his song, and for this there had to be elaborate preparations during which time you could send all the messages to Garcia around the world 12 times and what difference did it make to anybody because here we were dealing with the pit and prune juice of poor beat life itself and the pathos of people in the god-awful streets. So he said it and sang it. Close your... And blew it way up to the ceiling with a big voice that, not like mine, I'm just trying to imitate him, that came not from training but feeling and that much better, and blew it through the stars and on up. Eyes. And in arpeggios of applause, staggered off the platform, ruefully, broodingly, non-satisfied, artistic, arrogant. He sat in the corner with a bunch of boys, paid no attention to him. They gave him beers. He looked down and wept. He was the greatest. And Dean and I went over to talk to him. We invited him out to the car. In the car, he suddenly yelled, Yeah, ain't nothing I like better than good kicks. Where do we go? Dean jumped up and down in the seat, and giggling maniacally. Later, later, said Freddy. I'll get my boy to drive us down to Jackson's Nook. I got to sing, man. I live to sing. Been singing Close Your Eyes for months. I don't want to sing nothing else. What you two boys up to? We told him we were going to New York tomorrow. Lord, I ain't never been there, and they tell me it's a real jumping time. 
But I ain't got no cause complaining where I am. I'm married, you know. Oh, yes, said Dean, lighting up. And where is the little darling tonight? And I bet she's got lots of nice friends, man. What do you mean, said Freddie, looking at him, half smiling out of the corner. I told you I was married to her, didn't I? Oh, yes, oh, yes, blushed Dean. I was just asking, man, maybe she's got a couple of friends downtown or something, you know, man, a, a ball. I'm only looking for a ball, you know, a, a gang ball, man. Yeah, said Freddie. What's the good of balls? Life's too sad to be balling all the time, Jim. She, he said. She, eat. I ain't got no money and I don't care tonight. So we went back in for more. The girls were so disgusted with Dean and I for jumping around with everybody else that they had left by now. Gone to Jamson's Nook on foot. The car we'd come in and had to push down from Mission. Wouldn't run anyway, so we saw a horrible sight in the bar meanwhile. A white hipster fairy of some kind had come in wearing a Hawaiian shirt and was asking the big bull neck drummer if he could sit in and the musicians looked at him suspiciously he sat at the tubs and they started to beat off a blues number and he began stroking the snares with soft goofy bop brushes swaying his neck with that complacent right analyzed ecstasy that doesn't mean anything but too much tea and soft foods and goofy kicks and cafeterias and pads at dawn but he didn't care. And the musicians looked at him and said, yeah, yeah, that's what the man does. And he smiled joyously into space and kept the beat with buttery brushes, softly with bop subtleties, giggling, rippling background for big, solid, foghorn subtleties blues. The big bull neck drummer was waiting, sat waiting for his turn to come back. What's that man doing? He said, play the music. He said, what is he, what is he, what, what is he doing? He looked away red-eyed. But Freddy's boy showed up that moment, and he was in a little taut negro with a great big Cadillac. We all jumped in. He hunched over the wheel and blew the car clear across San Francisco without stopping once, 70 miles per hour. He was fulfilling his mission with a fixed smile, his destiny we'd expected of the rumors and songs of him, right through traffic, and nobody even noticed he was so good. Dean was in ecstasy. He said, dig this guy, man. Dig the way he sits right in the seat with the feel of the car under his both haunches. See? And a little bit forward, to the left, against the gut of the car, and he don't make any outward indication. And just balls that jack and can talk all night while doing it. Only thing is, he doesn't bother with life. Listen to them. Man, the things, the things. He lets Freddy do that. And Freddy's his boy. And tells him about life. Listen to those two cats. Man, the things I could tell you. The things I wish. Let's not stop, man. We've got to keep going. So Freddy's boy wound around a corner and bowled us right in front of Jackson's nook and was parked. Yes, yeah, do. So a cab squeaked to a stop in the street, and out of it jumped a skinny 70-year-old withered little Negro preacher man who threw a dollar bill at the cabbie and yelled, Blow! And ran to the club pulling on his coat, just come out of work. Dashed right through the downstairs bar yelling, Go, go, go! Stumbled upstairs, almost falling on his face, and blew the door open and fell into the jazz session room with his hands out to support him against anything he might fall on. And he fell right on Lampshade, who was reduced to working as a waiter in Jackson's Nook that summer. The great red dot Lampshade, whom I'd seen shout the blues with veins howling in his neck and his overcoat on. And the music was there, blasting and blasting, and the preacher man stood transfixed in the door, screaming, blow, blow, blow. And the man was a little short colored boy with an alto horn that Dean said obviously he lived with his grandmother. Just like my boy Jim in Denver. Sleeps all day and blows all night and blows a hundred choruses before he's ready to jump, man, and that's what he's doing. It's Allen Ginsberg, screamed Dean above the fury. And it was this little grandmother's boy with a scraped up alto had beady, glittering eyes, small crooked feet, spindly legs, and formal black pants, like our friend. And he hopped and flopped with his horn and threw his feet around and kept his eyes transfixed on the audience, which was just people laughing at a dozen tables, the room 30 by 30 feet and low ceiling, and he never stopped. He was very simple in his ideas. Ideas meant nothing to him. What he liked was a surprise of a new simple variation of chorus. He'd go from ta potato rup and ta potato rup repeating and hopping to it and kissing and smiling into his horn and then to ta-pa-tiddle-a-dee-rub, ta-pa-tiddle-a-dee-rub. 
It was all great moments of laughter and understanding for him and everyone else who heard. His tone was clear as a bell, high, pure, and blew straight in our faces from two feet away. Dean stood in front of him, oblivious to everything else in the world, with his head bowed, his hands socking in together, his whole body jumping on his heels in the sweat. Always as the sweat was pouring and splashing down his tormented neck to literally lie in a pool at his feet. The girls, Galatea and Alice, were there, and it took us five minutes to realize it. Wow, Frisco nights. The end of the continent then, and the end of the road, and the end of all dulled out. Lampshade was roaring around with trays of beer. Everything he did was in rhythm. He yelled at the waitress with the beat. Hey now, baby, baby, make a way, make a way. It's lampshade coming your way. And he hurled by her with the beers in the air and roared through the swinging doors in the kitchen and danced with the cooks and came on sweating back. And Ronnie Morgan... I call him Ronnie Morgan, who'd earlier in the evening performed at the Hay Now Club. I call it the Hay Now Club. Screaming and kicking over the mic, now sat absolutely motionless at a corner table with an untouched drink in front of him, staring gook-eyed into space, his hands hanging at his sides till they almost touched the floor. His feet outspread like lolling tongues, his body shriveled into absolute weariness and entranced sorrow and what all was on his mind. A man who knocked himself out every night and let the others put the quietus to him at dawn. Everything swirled around him like a cloud. And that little grandmother's alto, that little Carlo Marx, hopped and monkey danced with his magic horn and blew 200 choruses of blues, each one more frantic than the other, and no signs of failing energy or willingness to call anything a day. The whole room shivered. It has since been closed down. So Dean and I raced on to the East Coast. At one point, we drove a 1947 Cadillac limousine across the state of Nebraska at 110 miles an hour, beating hot-shot passenger trains and steel-wheel freights in one nervous, shuddering snap-up of the gas. We told stories and zoomed east. There were hobos by the tracks, wino bottles, the moon shining on wood fires. There were white-faced cows out in the plains, dim as nuns. There was dawn, Iowa, Mississippi River at Davenport, and Chicago by nightfall. Oh, man, said Dean to me as we stood in front of a bar on North Clark Street in a hot summer night. Dig these old Chinamen that cut by Chicago. What a weird town. And what women in that window up there, just looking down, you know, and they're standing there in the window. Just big wide eyes waiting. Sal, we got to go and never stop going till we get there. I said, where are we going, Dean? He says, obvious questions, say Charlie Chan, but we got to go. Then here come a gang of young bop musicians carrying their instruments out of cars. They piled right into the saloon and we followed them. They set themselves up and started blowing. There we were. The leader was a slender, drooping, curly-haired, pursy-mouthed tenor man, thin of shoulder, 21, lean, loose, blowing modern and soft, cool in the sports shirt without undershirt, self-indulgent, sneering, Dean and I were like car thieves and juvenile heroes on a mad, with our T-shirts and beards and torn pants, unshaven faces. But the bop, the combo, how that cool leader picked up his horn and frowned in it and blew cool and complex and was dainty, stamping his foot to catch ideas and ducked to miss others, saying, wail, very quietly, when the other boys took solos. He was the leader, the encourager, the schoolmaker, the tesh maker. The Bix, the Louis, in the great formal school of new underground subterranean American music that would someday be studied all over the universities of Europe and the world. Then there was Prez, a husky handsome blonde like a freckled boxer, like Jackie Cooper, meticulously molded in a sharkskin plaid suit with the long drape and the collar falling back and the tie undone for exact sharpness and casualness. Sweating and hitching up his horn and writhing into it in a tone just like Prez, less the young himself. Blowing round and less alike as they all leaned and jammed together the heroes of the hip generation. Dean said, you see, man, Prez has the technical anxieties of a money-making musician. He's the only one who's expensively dressed, obvious big band employee. See him grow worried when he blows a clinker. But the that leader, that cool cat there, tells him not to worry and just blow truth. And they roll into a tune. Idaho, and the Negro Alto High School broadgash mouth yard bird tall kid blows over their heads in a thing of his own, moveless on the horn, fingering, erect, an idealist who reads Homer and Bird, cool, contemplative, grave, 
and raises his horn and blows into it quietly and thoughtfully and elicits bird-like phrases and architectural Miles Davis logics, the children of the great bop innovators. Because once there was Louis Armstrong blowing his beautiful top in the muds in New Orleans, before him the mad tuba players and trombone kings who paraded on official days or funeral days and broke up their marches and their Sousa marches into ragtime on Bourbon, Dauphine, South Rampart, and Perdido Street, too. After which came Swing and Roy Eldridge, vigorous and virile, blasting the horn for everything it had and waves of power, a natural, tuneful reason. I want a little girl. And I got rhythm, a thousand courses of wonderful. Leaning to it with glittering eyes, Roy, and a lovely smile, and sending out broadcast to rock the jazz world. Then had come Charlie Parker, a kid in his mother's woodshed in Kansas City. The dirty snow in late March, smoke from stovepipes, wood hats, pitiful brown mouths breathing vapor, faint noise of music from down the way, Charlie Parker blowing his tied-together alto among the logs, practicing on rainy days in the log shed, coming out to watch the old swinging Basie and Benny Moten band that had Hot Lips Page and the rest, Lost names in Swing and Casey. Nostalgia of alcohol. Human mouths chewing and talking in smoky, noisy jazz rooms. Yeah, 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 yeah. Last Sunday afternoon in the long red sunset, the lost girl, the spilt wine. Charlie Parker leaving home in unhappiness and coming to the apple and meeting Mad Monk and Madder Gillespie. Charlie Parker in his early days when he was out of his mind and walked in a circle while playing his horn. Younger than Lester also from KC, that gloomy, saintly goof in whom the history of jazz is wrapped, Lester. Here were the children of the modern jazz night blowing their horns and instruments with belief. It was Lester started it all. His fame and his smoothness as lost as Maurice Chevalier in a stage door poster. His drape, his drooping melancholy disposition in the sidewalk, in the door, his pork pie hat, They'd say, at sessions all over the country, from Kansas City to the Apple and back to L.A., they called them pork pie because they'd wear that gone hat, man, and blow at it. What door-standing influence has Dean gained from this cultural master of his generation? What mysteries, as well as masteries? What styles, sorrows, collars, the removal of collars, the removal of lapels, the crepe sole shoes, the beauty goof, that sneer of Lester's, that compassion for the dead, which Billy has to, Lady Day. Those poor little musicians in Chicago, their love of Lester, early heroisms in the room, records of Lester, early count, suits hanging in the closet, tanned evenings in the rosy ballroom, the great tenor solo in the shoeshine jukebox, you can hear Lester blow and he is the greatness of America and a single Negro musician. Lester is just like the river. The river starts in near Butte, Montana in frozen snow caps at Three Forks and meanders on down across states and entire territorial areas of dun bleak land with Hawthorne crackling in the sleet. Picks up rivers at Bismarck, Omaha and St. Louis just north, another at Cairo, Another on Arkansas, Tennessee, comes deluging on New Orleans with muddy news from the land and a roar of subterranean excitement that is like the vibration of the entire land, sucked of its gut in mad midnight, fevered, hot, the big mud hole, rank, claw pole, old frogular, pawed soul, titanic Mississippi from the north, full of wires, cold wood, and horn. Lester, so holding his horn high in Dr. Pepper Chicken Shack's back street basey KC, wearing greasy smeared corduroy big pants and in torn flap smoking jacket without straw, scuffle up shoes all slopey Mother Hubbard, soft pudding and key ring, early handkerchiefs, hands up, arms up, horn horizontal, shining dull, in wood brown whiskey house with ammoniac urine from broken gut bottles around feckle, pukey bowl, and a gal sprawled in it, legs spread in brown cotton stockings, bleeding at belted mouth, moaning, yes, as Lester, horn-placed, has started blowing. Blow for me, mother, blow for me, she sang. 
1938, later, earlier. Miles is still on his daddy's checkered knee. Louis only got 20 years behind him. And Lester blows old Kansas City to ecstasy. And now Americans from coast to coast go mad and fall by and everybody's picking up. Stranger flowers now than ever. For, as the Negro alto kid mused over everyone's head with dignity, the slender blonde kid from Curtis Street, Denver, jeans and studded belt and red shirt, sucked on his mouthpiece while waiting for the others to finish. And when they did, he started. And you had to look around to see where the new solo was coming from, for it was coming from his angelical, smiling lips upon the mouthpiece, and it was a soft, sweet, fairy tale solo he played. A new kind of sound in the night. Sweet, plaintive, cold, like cold jazz. Someone from South Main Street, or Market, or Canal, or Streetcar. He's the sweet new alto blowing the tiny, heart-breaking salute in the night which is coming. Beauteous and whistling horn, blown easily but fully in a soft reed. Now it comes piercing, thin lament, completely softened. The new sound, the prettiest. And the bass player, wiry red head with wild eyes, jabbing his hips at the fiddle with every driving slap at hot moments, his mouth hung open, behind him driving the sad-looking dissipated drummer, completely goofed, chewing gum, wide-eyed, rocking his neck, dropping bombs with his foot, urging balloons, the piano is a big, husky, Italian truck-driving kid with meaty hands and a burly and thoughtful joy. If anybody start a fight with the band, he will step down. Here he is dropping huge chords like a wolfian horse turdying in a steamy Brooklyn winter morn. They played an hour. Nobody was listening. Old North Clark bums lolled at the bar. Gals screeched in the street. Secret people went by. Noises of hoochie-coochie interfered. They went right on playing. Idaho, no offense tunes. I'm in the mood. Out on the sidewalk came in an apparition. A 16-year-old kid with a goatee and a trombone case. Thin as rickets, mad-faced. He wanted to join the group and blow with them. They knew him from before and didn't want to be bothered. He crept into the bar and meekly undid his trombone case and raised the horn to his lips. No opening. Nobody looked at him. They finished, packed up, and left for another bar. The boy had his horn out, all assembled and polished of bell, and no one cared. He wanted to jump. He was the Chicago kid. He slapped on his dark glasses, raised the trombone to his lips alone in the bar, and went, Bop! Then he rushed out after them. They just wouldn't let him play with them, just like the Sandlot baseball gang back at the gas tank. All these guys live with their grandmothers, said Dean, just like my boy Jim, I I'm telling you. And we rushed after the whole gang. We went across the street. We went in. There is no end to the night. The great roar of Chicago dawn. We all staggered out and shuddered in the raggedness. It would start all over tomorrow night. So we rushed on to New York. Ain't nothing left after that, said Dean. Woo! He said, Yeah, we seek to find new phrases. We try hard, I said. We writhe and twist and blow. Every now and then a clear harmonic cry gives new suggestions of a tune, a thought that will someday be the only tune and thought in the world and which will raise men's soul to joy. We find it, we lose, we wrestle for it, we find it again, we laugh, we moan. Go moan for man. It's the pathos of people that gets us down, all the lovers in this dream.